um, which doesn't always fare well for us. No, not always. Some, and again, it sounds like it should work, but it doesn't. And not always. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. And yeah. you don't want to get caught in that situation if you're not prepared for it. If you're prepared for it and you've planned for it, no problem. Yeah. But you don't want to get caught. So you, you've got to know. And, you know, so going back to what you were saying before, you know, um, can you at what kind of interest are you adding on at what point and all these kind of things that goes back to the origination side of things where hopefully yeah. you know how to do that and hopefully you know you know what you can do in your state or whatever state you're originating in uh you've added in the correct language and terms that can be allowed for your area uh, or wherever you're originating so and again if you don't know that learn yeah. <laughs> because it can make and, a huge difference and two Us. points you said i recently had an originator come up to me and says dave um why do I need Dodd Frank? I'm still to owner occupied person. I'm allowed to do three a year. Um, uh -huh. I'm not going to call any names because the case they're, they're on right now. But the problem is they didn't understand that. Yes, you can write three in your name as an originator, but if you're dealing with a owner, owner occupied, there's a set of rules done by them that needs to be followed. Um, right. It's not about how many loans you can originate. It's what kind of note you can put in place. And if they're in a bad spot where you're, a borrower in a really bad position, that note can be violated, the violent Dodd Frank laws, and you really need to address that. Which next month we'll be covering a lot of uh, what, how to create a successful positive note, but also mm -hmm. what makes, what can you add to it to make it more valuable, which mm -hmm. leads to the idea of if you're originating notes and you're listening to this, adding in a seller, a servicer fee is great. Yeah. Right. And then you're bidding your non-performing assets, or your performing assets. Be sure to subtract the servicing fee unless the note includes a servicing fee inside the the, the P and I plus the servicing fee. Yeah, it's it's kind of included in that taxes and insurance category yep. where it's an extra fee on top of whatever the the principal and interest is. But that allows you to bid higher because you don't have to subtract. Your thirty-five right. or your thirty or twenty, whatever servicer charges for your performing asset, I can literally take the entire P and I, which yeah. means my returns will go dramatically up. So if you are bidding at a building out a bid calculator, be sure to subtract that, but also have a trigger that you can adjust it and say, "Listen, I don't need to subtract it." So this note already includes the ability to pay for the servicing outside of this P and I payment. Right. So let's get into preference, just just for fun. Ooh. What do you like better, performing or non-performing? So it's funny you say that. <laughs> you know, three years ago, I could care less about performing assets. I would love to do what everyone says, right? The, the rule of thumb was buy a non-performing and flip it over to performing. And I think it was talked about so much, people thought it was normal. Right. Um, it was a goal, not something we can always achieve. And you hoped in you try working things out to make it happen. But I like the non-performing because of the fact that it can skyrocket returns, ridiculous 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, ridiculous returns with non-performing, especially if they reinstate or if you made a killer deal with the sellers or you bought an asset where they thought the value was X, Y, Z, and you know it was much higher than that, right? Um, so when you're bidding on these assets, you know, make sure you look at that value of the property, part of that calculator, um, because that may actually give you a leg up, especially if you know the local area. Yeah. Now, granted, today things have changed. And for me, it's not about do I want non-performing performing? It's what is right now, quote unquote, on sale or the best price. We're yeah. buying more performers now than we did non-performing. Um, it used to be 85 or so percent non-performing. And now we flipped over. Now we're about 85% performing assets that we're buying simply because the return is there. Um, we're trickling in some partials and whatnot. Um, and we're evaluating a large commercial deal as well. But we're either buying those performing assets at a good return um, or we're buying you know, uh, a partial situation. But we're mm -hmm. not buying as many non-performing simply because the pricing for non-performing hasn't been there recently. Um, but we're hearing second quarter may change a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. And, and there are still deals out there and I'm still buying the non-performing, but I agree with you. And then 
Yeah. Uh, I'm buying a lot more of uh, the performing these days than I used to. Like you said, I used to think on performing, I mean, whatever, <laughs> yeah. but, but the return wasn't attractive enough to, to lure me into that. Um, and I wonder if part of it is just, I'm just getting old. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, yes. Just, it's too much work, too much headache. Absolutely. It is. And the performing, without question, it's a much easier thing to manage. Um, the returns aren't as high. Their potential yeah. return is not as high, uh, but it's a lot less work. Yeah. And so that's that's very attractive to me as Due well. Due diligence is a little bit easier, right? Yeah. You're not so worried about the, the the value of the property as much. The collateral files is usually secure. Yeah. Um, it all works. But I wanted to stress upon the fact that if you're bidding every asset at performing as a performing moving forward, you're asking for a lot of problems. And as well as we said numerous times, if you're bidding on assets that are non performing strictly based on a percentage of UPB or whatever, and you're forgetting the, the interest rate, um, you're ignoring the different state it's in mm -hmm. um, or all the costs, you're really missing out on the big pieces of that note. Um, and if you're doing this with other people's money, yeah, you're going to get yourself in bad shape. Um, luckily, when we got first got started, I wasn't you. I was using a lot of people's money, but our asset pricing was a lot different back then. Um, a lot, yeah. yeah. So today's world, you need to be more precise. You need to yeah. know um, what Texas law is versus Ohio versus you know what your different exit strategies and which exit strategies is the most concerning in each deal. Yeah. And be aware of that, because if you're not, you're going to be in a bad spot um, moving forward with that deal. And as we talk about in our class, um, the 10 week, even if you want to do the five week, uh, we start off with talking about the mindset and figuring out where you're going to be and what mm -hmm. you should target first seconds performing or non. And then we jump right into building that calculator, yeah. truly building a crazy wild calculator that you can plug and play assets desired returns, kick out your returns, and know where you should be with a bunch of charts that you can tag things such as statute limitations, right. such as, you know, what is a Texas time frame? What is Florida's time frame? Um, what states have debt licenses? Things like that is part of the resources that we use in our calculators to know what we should be doing with that asset. And we yeah. use those tools in this in our series, which you'll get a hold of, to yeah. make sure that we're we're in a better spot than if we just bid wildly. Yeah, you've got to be a lot sharper than you used to have to be. Yeah. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, you could pretty much shoot in the hip and you'd hit something. Uh, yeah, and absolutely. today, that's not the case. You've got to be a lot sharper. You've got to be a lot more uh, in tune and and on the ball with everything. Everything from your due diligence to even your, like you say, your state knowledge, all of those things, you've got to be much more um, precise and much sharper than you used to have to be. Yeah. So it's it's worth it to get that education. It's worth it to to practice, practice, practice. And if you're not sure about the financial calculator, um, time value uh, things, either the manual or we we also show you how to do in a spreadsheet. So you can do fifty assets in a blink of an eye. That class also talks about that because that's a key thing. If you don't know what the present value is, what's the time value, what's a term, what's a rate. How do you calculate this? And what does it mean? We yeah. talk about that because if you're not learning about that in any of your classes, you're missing the biggest part of a promissory you note know, of any kind is right. the terms and the numbers. Because yeah. you're buying an IOU with a secured property. The secured property is a secondary thing. It just secures the, the note, the promissory you note. Know. So you need to understand those factors and numbers so you get into it. So um, I encourage you guys, if you're already you should reach out to us. We wanted to show you guys the difference between a performing calculator and non-performing, when to use it. Yeah. When you're looking at non-performing assets, there are numerous, numerous expenses that go into it, right? And mm -hmm. not every expense is into every category. But what you can also target is the different extra strategies and why do they matter? And right. some of the key things for me is if there's equity or not, Right, that plays a huge role because my exits change, yeah, based on equity. Right, yeah, and then, and again, it comes down to a lot of preference. Are do you want to put in all the extra work for a non-performer that you may not get paid on for you know nine, twelve months from now, uh, or are you looking for something that's that's more, for lack of a better term, predictable? 
uh, which, uh, which is what we're saying. It's not always predictable, but it's more Not sure if I lost your audio or not, but uh, nope. I, I think I lost your audio. I'm not sure if we lost your audio, but I apologize if we did. So um, for me, I, I think with regards to the bidding structure and notes, when you're, we ran across this recently with an investor that didn't understand why I would bid such a significant drop when the value of the property worth a hundred, and the the balance of the loan was sixty thousand, they didn't understand why I was not bidding sixty five or seventy, and right. they couldn't understand what why would I not? I mean, the property worth seventy, and what we had to explain to them is I wasn't buying the property, I right. was buying the note. And if for those who don't understand, if there's equity in the property, and you go forward to buy that that note, and you're expecting to get the equity. Once you foreclose on it, you're not 100% going to get the equity. And right. the reason is, it may sell at auction. And if it goes third party to an outside investor, you lose all that equity in that property because you don't get the property back. 